This is the JWN Podcast. When I met my guest for this episode back in the 90s, he was known in the underground music scene as Johnny X, the guitarist for New Jersey punk rock legend Sticks and Stones. His legend was cemented into wax in the song The Ballad of Johnny X by their New Jersey brethren, the Bouncing Souls, who wrote the opening line, Johnny says he's bound by only six strings to this world. Well, Johnny's given name is Mike Cavallaro, and his imagination and artistic skill has led to a long, successful career in cartooning, animation, and creating graphic novels. He's worked for the biggest names in the business, from DC and Image Comics to MTV and Cartoon Network. He's currently working on the Nico Bravo graphic novel series, which he's created, written, and drawn. The first book, Nico Bravo and the Hound of Hades, was featured on the New York Public Library Best of List for 2019. The next book in the series, Nico Bravo and the Cellar Dwellers, is due out on August 25th. I know you'll enjoy this look into the world of a true professional artist. Here's my conversation with Mike Cavallaro. So let me tell you um, the, the, the order of operations of how this came about. I have... Uh, well, I interviewed a, a guy I know who just put out his first like self-published uh, comic book. Huh? And then I saw, I was like, you know, uh, Johnny X, <laughs> as I used to know you, yeah, from back in the day, yeah. He he he's a comic book artist, and I looked up your Instagram account. And I was like, holy shit, <laughs> this guy's like, <laughs> a, like, wow. Um, you know, it's funny you. I saw you um, get on on some of those posts that I've been making recently. You kind of came uh, on board my Instagram uh, around the time I started seriously using it because it was sort of just sitting there. And after I got your email, I, I read your Instagram handle as Joel. Yeah. Everybody. <laughs> and then it was that. Right, and then after I got your email, I was like, "Joe Latex." <laughs> yeah, so it, it's one of those things. There are people down here. I live in Charleston now, South Carolina, and uh -huh. there are people down here yeah, cool. that think my name is Joel, and half most of the time I don't correct them. I'm just like, whatever. Yeah, it is what it yeah. is. I, I I've been living with that handle for so long that I just never thought to change it. And um, yeah, yeah. And so now people think I'm Joel Eight X, and I'm like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's how I read it. That's how I read it. It's only afterwards that I, I realized it was you. Luckily, that name is yeah. always available on every social media platform. <laughs> it's never yeah, taken. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, who's your who's your friend? Uh, his name is Marcus. Marcus Cripps. And uh, he's a young guy. Um, I met him a couple years ago. Probably about three or four years at this point. Um, huh. While I was going to these figure drawing classes like sessions oh, cool. that they were having so, so it was very it was like a really underground type of thing it started out there was this little art collective that was doing it and you just came in you paid five bucks um so that they could pay the uh the model and you would just do you know do time drawings and it was fantastic it was so much fun and then it kind of started moving around that we found out there's other places in other towns close by that would do it so we'd go to those and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And I met him and uh, now his his longtime girlfriend. They put out this this comic together, and uh, oh, yeah, cool. they're and they're phenomenal artists. So I was uh, all excited when they were oh, all right. We're gonna put together this this uh, comic book that's based on uh, cats. It's a western, <laughs> and it, it's it, you know it's really cool. They it's total um, DIY. The they're doing they did it on like a five by seven black and white print and it looks like it looks yep. like a moleskin basically. And cool. it, yeah. But I was just, you know, I, I was thinking about it and then it just kind of like got my brain thinking. I'm like, who else do I know that? Because I know there's Matt Rosenberg. I don't know if you know him. I I don't think he, I know. He's he does just, some of the Archie comics. In fact, I have one sitting oh. in front of me, Archie Meets the Ramones. <laughs> Yeah, all right. I've se I've seen that. I didn't I didn't know his name. Yeah, and he well he used to work with Tommy Rockstar, the guy who was who was oh, also wow. in, in uh, our old band Latex Generation, and um, they he was in that screen printing business with Tommy for a long time, 
And then oh, he went okay. off to, to do, uh, to, he got very heavily involved in comic books. I might have to tap him up yeah. as well <laughs> to see what yeah, he's up yeah. to these days. But I was, you know, I was just like, I, then of course I looked at your Instagram uh, when I found you and I was like, holy cow. And I ordered, um, the, the first Nico Bravo book that you, you, oh, wow, that cool. you put out and it's thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I'm like, Oh, you got it. Yeah. Already. No, I, well, all right. Don't kill me. I ordered it on Amazon and I didn't know I had a moral, <laughs> like, like, um, battle in my head because I think, and this is total, this is why I'm like, just, I'm not educated in this. You know, for buying music, Amazon's not the best thing to do for an artist. But for books, yeah. I'm like, it's kind of like the charts make a big deal. So if you buy it from Amazon, doesn't it like affect the ranking? I'm not sure. Uh, it 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 does. It's not a negative for me. You know, uh, I I don't. I try. You know, I do use Amazon occasionally. I try not to. Um, I've really been trying not to during this pandemic. I don't think I've used them at all. Um, and I, you know, on my website, if you go to my website, I've like, you know, way, way back, I used to have Amazon links for my book. And I, I, a long time ago, I stripped all that out and replaced it with, you know, other, other ways to order books. So yeah, I, you know, I, I discourage it. Ha having worked for a few years in an independent bookstore, yes, I, I discourage people from using Amazon for books, but it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't impact me negatively, you know, it's a sale. Yeah. Um, and you know, every, every so often, you know, I'm, I'm stuck, I'm stuck buying something from Amazon, you know, it's, it's too. So <laughs> I do, I do it too, you know, it's, but it's usually not a book, but I do. It's it. one of those things that I'm, I'm, I like, I really thought about it. I'm like, well, if I order it from here, does that help you? It's kind of like, it's kind of like Spotify, you know, Spotify screws over musicians, yeah. but it yeah. also, as far as like getting them out there, it's the greatest discovery tool for musicians. So I will go and go yeah. to their band camp and, you know, buy a record or buy yeah. the music digitally, but I'm streaming it on Spotify because I can have all my playlists with all the other music that, you know, isn't, isn't available maybe on band camp or, the splintering yeah. of stuff makes it difficult to make a playlist. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. It's kind of well, well, I'm, just, I'm gonna I'm gonna appreciate your uh, your support nonetheless. Well, it's it's excellent. I actually gave it to my son uh, yesterday. Cool. I was like, "Hey, I need you to read this." How old is he's he? Sixteen. So, oh wow, he's, he's he's an avid reader. He's I'm like, here, you'll read this in four minutes. <laughs> he's yeah, it's it's not a long read. You know, I'd be curious to hear what he thinks because. In my imagination, I feel like you know the publisher bills it as a middle grade reader, uh, middle grade book, right? But uh, to me, I, I think you know if, if you're a fan of like Cartoon Network stuff or whatever, I don't think it matters how old you are. I think you know we all enjoy that stuff. But I, I haven't had much feedback from someone his age, so I'd be curious to see. I if, will definitely you know, let if, you know, and I'll and I'll I won't I haven't told him that I was like I haven't given him any kind of. Um, you know, warning or prep. I didn't say, "Hey, I know this guy. He wrote this yeah. book." I just said, "Here, I want you to read this and tell me what you think of it." Of course, he has good, good. He, he's he's a, he's probably asleep right now. He's he's on vampire schedule <laughs> at the moment. Um, it, yeah, he, but he he loves that kind of storyline. You know, he he's very big into fantasy, and so um, the fact that you incorporated it, there, it, first of all. You just said exactly what I wanted to say about reading it. I'm like, you do not write down to a children's level. No. You, you, in fact, no. It, it feels like you wrote it for any age. Um, yeah, I did. I, I, I didn't have any, anything in mind. You know, I certainly. I mean, the, the best way to write a terrible children's book is to write a children's book. Right. You know, you have to just, you have to write to the child that you are, or it's going to feel fake. Um, so I just try to entertain myself, you know, I've got the mind of a 10 year old. So, uh, I just, you know, if it made me laugh, it went in the book, well, you know, there was also like, I found a very, um, kind of a, not the same obviously, but because of the, the, the 
incorporating the Greek gods, um, not Greek gods, just gods in general. I was like, this has got a, a, mm-hmm. a, a slight Neil Gaiman f- flavor going on because it's very based on other mythologies. And it's like you found this way by creating this this store or this kind of marketplace for um, mythical creatures to bring all yeah. to tie all those things and also make your own. And, you know, it, it, it's such a, yeah. a great concept. I, I really, really think... Um, I, I always say this kind of stuff and, I, and I'm being genuine. I really think like you have something awesome there. Uh, what, Thank so you. I'll just get into that real quick. Well, I, I want to get into the history mm-hmm. of how you got to where you are, but let's, we're, we're talking about this now. So with um, that specific uh, work, what was, what was the origin of that? How did you come up with that? Uh, okay. So I was living in Brooklyn and um, I was, you know, I had been, I, th- I think at this point, I had been making comics professionally for over 20 years. And, um, you know, I was living uh, with my girlfriend in, in Brooklyn, and uh, I was working a couple days a week at this really great comic shop uh, that was only a few blocks from our apartment. <clears throat> and, um, you know, uh, I would I would go in on like new new comic book day and and get there early and we would unbox the books put the book uh, put the books out and all that stuff and it was just something I really enjoyed and it got me out from behind the desk uh, for you know a few hours a week and um, the store was great and um, the staff was great so I was working there and a cool thing about this shop it was it's not there anymore it was called Bergen Street Comics and the cool thing about the shop was was. I want to say pretty much everyone who worked there was a comics creator. Um, And that, that could mean that they were, you know, an award winning pro or they were a self publisher or like an underground artist, but in, in pretty much every capacity, every level of comics making was sort of represented by the staff of that store. So I just think it was a great place um, that had like a, a very, uh, unique insight into what we were selling because of that, right? Yeah. And so there was a guy who worked there with me. His name was Nick Abadzis. If you don't know, uh, Nick Abadzis is like a comics veteran. Um, he was a Marvel UK editor. He's an amazing writer. He's an interesting, incredible artist. Um, he's won pretty much every conceivable award with his books. Um, a, a standout book of his is, is called Laika. And um, you know, it's the story of the Russian dog that they shot into space. Um, but he, he brings so much research, but then so much of his own sort of insight um, to the um, book. You know, and, it, and like I said, it's kind of won everything. And it, it's a landmark book that you should really check out. Sure. Um, so so Nick worked there too, you know, and we knew each other and stuff. And um, I was sort of like, I think it was pretty much... Um, slow with with you know comics work you know i was looking for something and so nick put me together with this editor named ben sharp ben was an editor for a um a weekly comics anthology called the phoenix magazine that's uh published in the uk and um it's an amazing like high production value beautiful um uh, magazine that comes out. It's, it's similar. If you've ever seen like Nickelodeon magazine, it's similar to that, but you know, Nickelodeon is like this, you know, it's a corporate thing. Uh, and I'm, and I'm not, um, I'm not, I know I, I have friends that, you know, do work for Nickelodeon magazine. It's a great magazine. I'm just, you know, it's just a, a fact that you know, this is like this corporate, <laughs> Well, it's, it's, uh, you know, y- your work for hire, yeah. like this is where this is going to come up. I think a million mm-hmm. times it is, it's a big thing for me that the, uh, the, the work for hire versus creator owned situation is sort of like central to every decision I make. And like, you know, Nickelodeon is, it's, it's a huge corporation and, and it's a beautiful magazine. Uh, and if you contribute to it, you're working on Nickelodeon properties uh, the, the difference with the Phoenix is that it, it has the same production values, but everything in it is creator owned, Wow, which is mind boggling. We don't really have much in the, in the U S like that. 
So he put me together with Ben, and all Ben was asking for, they do these, um, they serialize long form stories where they'll do like eight pages a week of, of an ongoing story, but they have to fill it in with these little four page one shots, like these done in one four page stories. So that's what they're always hunting for. And, and so Nick put me together with this guy, Ben, thinking I could get a little gig out of it. In my mind, like if I had to make something, I want to make something that has longevity. I don't, I don't want to go through the work of inventing something to do four pages and never see it again. So I never thought of it as a four pager, you yeah. know, I mean, there are four page episodes, but I, I knew I was good. If this worked that I was going to want to do it again. So Ben sent me a sample issue of the Phoenix so I could get a feel for, you know, what the magazine was. And, um, I noticed a few things. There were, there was a science fiction, story in it there was something with dinosaurs in it um there was a pirates a story with pirates mm -hmm. right like there were these these genres and one thing that stood out to me was there was no myth there was no mythology in the magazine and so uh, i saw a gap and i i just thought about the shop that i was working in you know, it was, a, it was an amazing shop. I loved it. I loved that uh, comic shop. And the fact that it was located in New York City, um, you know, people are coming to New York all the time. Um, they, uh, in terms of comics, there's a huge uh, comics community in New York, meaning uh, creators, yeah. right? A lot, of, a lot of top names live in New York, right? And uh, creators are always coming to New York for conventions or what have you. So, uh, we had a lot of people visiting the store who were, uh, we, we also did a lot of, uh, book launches and events. So we would host them too. And, and we had great taste. So we would have like Jaime Hernandez or Louis Trondheim or, you know, literally my heroes, you know, the, in, in many cases, the people who inspired me to become a cartoonist. Right, were people whose uh, we we did their book release party for their new book, right? And I got to meet these people. That's amazing. And uh, it it was it was amazing. And on any given day that I was there, um, someone who was was you know hero to, to me, you know, a, a comics hero to me, could could walk in the door just to shop, you know. And so the idea of you know wanting to do some kind of four page pitch for the Phoenix, but something that could have legs and, and that could be something else combined with someone who works in a shop, uh, where heroes could stop by. That was the Genesis of Nico Bravo. And, you know, as you know, the, the Nico Bravo story is, you know, Nico is a, is a kid who works in a, a basically a general store for gods and mythical creatures and his boss is the god Vulcan, and uh, he's the maker god, you know, he's the Roman maker god, and, um, and he makes all the stuff that all the other gods and mythical creatures need to do their jobs, and his co-workers are Lula the Sphinx, and uh, this guy Buck, who's a unicorn, who's sort of a deranged um, veteran of uh, the unicorn wars. Um, so yeah, I mean, it really came out of where I, where I was, you know, personally at the time, you know, I made, Lee, uh, I made Nico kind of, um, he's a little, you know, he's the kind of kid you'd see at a punk rock show. You know, I, I drew, I, I made him from what I know, you know, he, I gave him my job, you know, he worked in a, he works in a great shop. You know, I, I, I gave him a hoodie and, and a little, uh, you know, beanie cap, you know, and, and tight jeans and sneakers, you know, the way you see kids at a punk rock show and that's, you know, and then I just went. You know, and I, I did that for the Phoenix. I did these little four pagers for the Phoenix for a couple of years. Um, and I, it really was like a boot camp for me because um, a lot of my projects up to that point had been collaborations uh, with writers where they furnish the manuscript mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I provide like the the art and uh, that's, and I love doing that. And, you know, I still do that and that's great, but I, I didn't have a lot of experience writing and writing is really hard. 
so having to do these like, you know, stories that had a beginning, a middle, and end in four pages, that was really tough for me. It was like a great, great exercise for me. Um, and I, I really learned the characters, you know, it was great training, but the whole time I was on them to let me do a longer story. And they kept saying like, sure, sure. <laughs> but do, do one, do one more four just pager more. and then we'll talk about that. Just one <laughs> more and then we'll talk. It. it just never happened. And, and I think we just exhausted each other. Like, you know I what? think I wore them out. That worked out. That, that worked out for you though. In, in the fact that it did. when I read this book, I was, you know, I was coming into it kind of blind and the mm-hmm. characters are all so f- uh, fleshed out. Like they, they're all the build, there's character building within it because for, I guess a lot of people who are reading it since, since uh, you were putting them out overseas for the most part, it sounds like. Yeah. Nobody saw it. So the character building happens in the book but they're so well, you know what I'm saying? They're so well formed. They're, they're concisely brought out. Like each character gets a little uh, piece of, of backstory thrown into it. And, and it's just, it, it, it works so well. And at first I was like, is this like already a cartoon or something that exists? Like I really felt like this was coming from something like we were, we were coming into something that had existed. So now that you're telling me that like, oh, this existed somewhere else to get before it got to the point where you've published this book, yeah. it makes a whole lot of sense because it seems so, uh, for lack of a better ter- term, mature in its, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't feel like a pilot uh, of, a, of a comic. It feels like something Thank that's you. been around, which I guess it has been. Yeah. Well, you know, it, uh, the shop and Vulcan and Nico that's what we had in the Phoenix. Um, there was a, maybe halfway through, I brought in a character who was a Sphinx, like, like Lula. His name was Leon Sphinx. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I, felt, I started to feel like I needed to build the cast out a little bit more. And so Leon came in about halfway through, but, um, uh, then I, you know, I stopped. I stopped uh, doing stuff with the Phoenix, and it took about a year to sort of like tear it down and build it back up. And that's when I added Lula and Buck, and sort of redesigned the way it looked, and 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 kind of formulated the idea that would become uh, the first book, Nico Bravo and the Hound of Hades. So it, I did. There was a lot of. I, I had a lot of time to get comfortable with the with the concept and with Nico and Vulcan and the shop. And then there was this period of just sort of like reworking it uh, to get to um, what you saw. But, you know, I, I got to say at this point, like writing the thing terrified me. And my editor, this guy, Mark Siegel, um, he's the uh, um, editorial director of First Second Books. And we had already done a few books together. And I love working with Mark. Um, he's a great editor. And as I was going into it, um, he gave me this book. I actually have it. Um, he gave me this book. It was, you know how there's like a million of these, like how to write screenplay books. There's like, a, it's like an entire genre unto itself. Oh, yeah. and now it's just on YouTube. So you'll find 4 billion <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's... videos on how to write a screenplay. Yeah. Um, so he gave me this one and I was sort of like, Ugh, another one of these, right? But it's called The Art of Character, and it's by this guy, David Corbett. Uh, And he was just trying to kind of help me, right? And the only thing I... I think I read about half of this thing. All these these books, they all bore me. Um, No no offense to this guy. Um, None of these books... I just can't can't read them, right? I got about halfway through this. And the thing that stuck with me from it was him saying... um, you know, your, your story has to reveal itself through the way the characters interact with each other and that you need to get your characters talking to each other in your mind, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and allow them to sort of steer the ship. If you try to force them into situations, it'll, it'll feel fake. And so I just, I'm just sort of riffing on what you said about, the, about it feeling like um, complete or, or 
matured, you know, was the word you used, you know, and I, I just want to say, I don't feel like I wrote the thing. I, and I'm not, you know, I'm not exaggerating. I really, um, feel like I, tr all I did was try to keep up with the characters as they were talking and acting. I, I had an outline that had one ending and the book has a different ending because they took it somewhere else. Wow. You know, like I really, um, I was along for the ride. I, I don't, I couldn't tell someone what I did. I don't feel like I did anything. I just feel like I was sitting in a room writing down what was, you know, what was being said. Of course the room, you know, is, is my imagination. And, and from that, you know, I've, I did a lot of, um, going around and, and talking to classes of uh, kids, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to promote the book after the book came out. And uh, I, I developed a, a thing that I would say at these, um, you know, at these, uh, I don't know, visits, um, where I, I would just explain, like, if, if you've ever had an argument with somebody, right, and then you go away, mm -hmm. right, the argument ends and, and <laughs> you go home or something, but the argument is still happening in your mind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? But you're saying things that you didn't say and they're saying things that they didn't say, right? It's like a it, you're not repeating it in your head, you're continuing it. Right? right? That's writing. That's, That's writing because th that didn't happen. That didn't happen. It's just that your mind is so engaged in in that scenario, right? It, 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 if you've ever if you've ever experienced what I'm talking about, you literally forget where you are. If you're walking, you actually didn't see the last hundred yards you just walked. Like you're so engaged in this thing that's happening in your mind that it has a life and a reality of its own, right? You know what I'm talking I, I, about, I could, right? We've all done it. I couldn't it. tell you how many times I've continued an internet argument while on my morning run. Of course, <laughs> of course. And so. So I, you know, like I, kids ask questions about writing and how do you write? And, and what I try to do is, that, you know, I, I bring that up and I say, that's where you got to get yourself. Obviously, everything in your book can't be an argument. You don't want to engage in everything like that. But you, you need to get your mind to that space where you're, you're not consciously doing anything. And, and um, these voices, right, these characters, you know, uh, they have a, a life of their own and it has a reality of its own, right? And so if you just imagine that happening to you and you sitting there at a keyboard trying to type it down, right? That's, that's that book, wow. right? And, and if, you, if you go back and, and look at it, like it really is dialogue driven. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 right? it could have easily have been um, a book. You could have expand, you know, just explained what was going on and painted the picture with words instead of with pictures. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about the chemistry of those characters together. And, you know, and, and so that really um, clicked with me. That was the one thing I took from this guy's book. And it really, uh, it really helped me um, to write this. And, 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 you know, a few, you know, many years ago, I, I was working, you know, I did a lot of animation and I worked uh, on a couple Cartoon Network shows. And we had a meeting once with some Cartoon Network executives. And they were talking about, you know, uh, series creation and, you know, what they look for in something. And, and at one point, one of them said, um, they, they want characters that, um, they don't want plot driven stuff. They want character driven stuff. And what that means is that you can take their characters and put them in a room with nothing in it, mm -hmm. right? And a story will happen because it'll come out. It'll come from them. They will create the story. Yeah, I mean, and think of some. Uh, wasn't there like a Seinfeld episode where it's just the whole thing's in a car or in a parking lot or something like that? Yeah. It's one scene, the whole episode, and it's it's yeah, one of the yeah, more memorable. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're all pretty. That shows bad example but as far as them all being pretty memorable but that episode yeah, yeah. stands out there's been a, that, a couple of shows that have done that where you know maybe two or three of the characters are stuck in a scenario um and that's the whole episode yeah it's the strength of the character that just drives the whole thing so i i just tried to 
lean on that and, and lean on the idea of just letting the characters steer the ship and uh, not sort of insert myself in it and just sort of let them tell me. And it's a really, it's a fascinating process because the thing reveals itself to you. You're, at, at, at certain moments, you're as surprised as the reader, you yeah. know? You're, you're you're letting them they, they're their own entities and these characters that you have created, but they're basically calling the shots at this point. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's 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 how it, that's it. That's that's my uh, recipe. So so when you were um, so a lot of comic book creation and animation and and things along those lines, it's teamwork. So I kind of liken it to being in a band. Like you have a guy drawing it you have another person doing ink you have the author you have someone coloring it or and then you know an editor and and it, it seems like it's a huge ordeal um what's that like like is there a for for lack of a better term like a, a position that you you find yourself playing when you're when you were in that situation on all these collaborations what um well the the short answer of that is, you know, I came into comics as a colorist. So in, in the sort of factory system that you're describing from, from the first few years of my career, I was a colorist. And it is, it is pretty much what you describe. But see, now we're getting, now we're going to got to go back to, or if you don't mind, no, I'm right. going to steer us back to this, this, uh, work for hire versus, um, creator owned mm -hmm. thing, because like you, I mean, you know, we know each other from, from bands and from punk rock bands and, you know, from like, you know, independent music. Right. right? And, um, you know, if you, if you can imagine music where, you know, up until say like the eighties or something, the only music was, um, major label music. Like imagine that, Yeah. you know, I mean, I, I mean, obviously major labels dominate, music but that but it was never true that that's all that there was that's right? all you were exposed to that's all they carried in the record stores it's it's all you, the magazines right, but every yeah. but every but every major wave every major like revolution in music was driven by something that came in from the outside right mm -hmm. everything so you know there there is Imagine if, if, if it was always the other way where um, the, the company develops a talent, right? And, and the songwriter writes what's going to be their hit song. And that's all there was. I mean, it, it, I, there's a, there's a, I think there's something cool about that sort of side of music, you know, and the, that history of music, like the Brill Building yeah. and, and that sort Session of stuff, you know? And then you had songwriters sure. that were on contract and... Yeah, I mean, there, there's it's fascinating, right? But but you know, most of what I love in music is is coming in from the outside. It's rock and roll. Right. It's punk well, it's rock. People talking you know? about the experiences that you're having instead of the lowest common denominator. So, yeah, it, right, yeah, All right. I mean, eventually the in, the industry it, it may it, it's the course of revolution where you become what you you know you become the industry, yeah. right? But but there's still another there's still a next thing there's always a next thing right that's what comics were like for the first fifty or so years you know comics were there was no viable um, alternative uh, not really I mean there was some underground stuff of course but there was very little viable um, alternative to uh, Marvel and DC comic books until you start to get really into the eighties where it starts to really become a movement and a force. And at that time, you know, that's when I started to become interested in comics. At that time, there was a magazine called the comics journal, um, that was published by Fantagraphics, and that was all run by this guy, Gary Groth. And so Gary was the sort of like ed editorial director of the comics journal magazine and the comics journal the, the, the basic idea of the comics journal was that they were going to look at comics and talk about comics without giving them a pass, right? Without, without this sort of like smirk or, or, you know, this idea that 
well, it's a comic book. It can't be held to the same standards as film. Right. It can't be held to the same standards as literature. The comics journal said no. They said, well, let, you know, well, what if, why don't we? You know, because if you, if you look outside of the United States, you know, comics around the world have matured at this time, you know, mm-hmm. far beyond what's being published by major publishers in the United States. Right. And there's, there's specific reasons for that. Right. But, but if you were aware of comics being published in China or Japan or France, right, then you're forced to sort of put them side by side with the, the sort of like, you know, very corporate controlled stuff that was being done in, in, in the U S by Marvel and DC up and up until that time. And, and, with rare exception, you know, they don't really cut the mustard. And so that was the whole thrust behind the comics journal. And it wasn't just about being critical. This is the important part that what the comics journal did for me. And I'm going to say for us, because I think I was in an isolated little town in New Jersey, getting this magazine, like a lifeline. And it was only until decades later that I realized this was happening to people like me everywhere. And we, we were a wave of people, right? Mm-hmm. But we, without knowing it, right? And, and I think a lot of the credit is due to the Comics Journal and to Gary Groth. Uh, and the, on, the, on the other writers, you know, there was a, a host of writers for the Comics Journal because what they, what they promised us, right? Without really anything, ex- you know, there wasn't so much tangible that they could hold up at that time, but they promised us that Comics would be literature, that the comics would be held on the same level of, com- of, of film and, and books, right? If we simply decided to do that, right? And it's, they really planted the seed, I think, them along with the evidence, right? The proof, which was comics like Love and Rockets, which, oh, by yeah. the way, is published <laughs> by the same publisher, the same publisher. Not only were they writing about this, that this could happen in the pages of the Comics Journal, but they were proving it by, by being the publisher of Love and Rockets. See? Uh, uh, Mouse was being serialized in Raw Magazine, mm-hmm. right? Um, the Dark Knight Returns came out from DC Comics. Watchmen came out from DC Comics. Uh, Daredevil Born Again came out from Marvel Comics. These were sort of like the lightning bolts. Oh, like the Spawn stuff of, was not DC or Marvel. Le- that was less so, Marlin, right? That, that was Image, Image. yeah. Yeah. It, it, there was this like sort of tidal wave happening kind of around at the same time saying that this could be something else, right? And, um, and you know, little by little, we we get to the point, like when I, when I started working in comics in 1991, um, all, all of that was in its infancy, right? Um, there was no, there were no graphic novels. There were no graphic novels, yeah. right? There were, there were monthly serialized comics. And I was working uh, at a publisher that made monthly superhero comic books because there was no alternative if you wanted to work, you know? And I kept showing my ideas and, you know, I was, I was hired as a colorist, but I, but I wanted to draw and write. And I kept showing my ideas to publishers who were sort of like, well, I don't know what it is. I don't, we don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, and again, I'm isolated. I'm sort of in my own bubble, but this is happening to people like me everywhere. We just don't know about each other, you know? And over the period of a few years, you, you have, you know, Mao's, Dark Knight, Watchmen, Born Again, this idea of repackaging these things as standalone trade paperbacks with a spine, um, you know, and, and doing more literary work, which is what I think Mao's kicked down that door to show uh, book market publishers that, uh, the, that the comics form was a mature form that could tell any kind of story, not just genre fiction. And an important... and. One final important piece, the same way that, that someone my age had their mind blown by Watchmen, by Dark Knight Returns, 
by Daredevil Born Again, by Mao's, right? Uh, these these things were just, there was nothing to, comp- to prepare us for these things, right? The same way that someone like myself who has been drawing their whole life, right? It's almost a given that I'm going to at least try to become a cartoonist, yeah. right? Not I, I may not succeed in doing that, but given the fact that I, I am a drawer, you know, I'm going to try that. There's other people who are just as mind blown and just as turned on by this stuff, but can't draw, you know, and they, but they love this stuff as much as I do. And this, this can't, can't be overlooked. Many of those people, you know, they become librarians. I mean, this sounds absurd, but unless you, like me, you've been to librarian conferences with 500 librarians who were psyched about graphic novels. (laughs) That's awesome, right? Yeah. This, this is an in, this is the invisible army that's rarely credited, right? Because they're my age, they got turned on the same way I did. They had to, you, you know. Again, to go back to our common roots, we're talking about the kids who couldn't play guitar, right? Who decided they were going to promote shows instead, and those those people are as important as the band members because without them, there's no community. Oh, yeah. There's no show. It, it, that's, that's the corollary. Like That's the librarian in terms of the graphic novel revolution because they're the ones who brought them into libraries and turned on a whole new generation right? that get us to the point where, where today every book market publisher I'm talking about the Macmillans, the Houghton Mifflins, the Pantheons, right? They all have a graphic novel imprint, and their sales are destroying the Marvel and the DC sales. Yeah, they, and and right? they, they tried to make like a digital comic book thing. I I mean, there was a bunch happening. of noise that happened at first, but then I, it, it kind of, I don't know, it feels like it's one of the forms that didn't take off yet. I don't know if it's just, if it's just not, maybe I'm wrong. Well, technically speaking, um, I think, I think what I I understand what you're talking about. I I think that for a, for a long time, what the question was how to monetize it, you know, Um, because people got very good at serializing web comics, but the question of how to monetize that, uh, was evasive. And I think that most people made it work by serializing something online for free, building an audience and parlaying that into an actual physical publishing contract. And that was this sort of um, indirect way of monetizing web comics. And that's what seemed to take off in the U S however, if you really want to look at readers and profit it's a fact that the, that the biggest, biggest publisher of comics on the planet is Line Webtoons. Really? It is a, yes, it's, it's a web comics um, portal. So they made it work. Because I was always and, thinking and that they, it would be hard for, as far as like the graphic novel slash regular comic book tradition, when you take away the physical collectability of it, because that's an, a whole other aspect of of comic books was, you know, the trade, the selling it back to the shop, the finding a rare comic book in the store, right? That whole thing, right? But that that's that's why I'm I'm ranting about this new the new market of well, not so new anymore, but the book market because, you know, the book market. What I'm talking about are are comic books, you know, Scholastic for second, um, you know, those sort of publishers that are making, you know, graphic novels, we're talking, you know, 144, 164 pages plus that have a spine that are treated like perennials rather than periodicals um, that are meant to be in libraries and on bookshelves versus, you know, the direct market, which is, you know, what you're talking about, the image comics, the Marvel comics, the DC comics, where they're still releasing 22 page uh, periodicals basically, that have that tradition of collectability, uh, speculation, uh, you know, back issue, where it's going to go up in value as a back issue, et cetera, et cetera. You know, in in order to sort of like 
continue to grow, right, and to, and to continue to be profitable, those direct market publishers, Marvel, DC, Image, they had to take, you know, six months to a year or something worth of these monthlies, bind them together in trade paperbacks and re-release them as, um, as trade paperbacks. You know, they call them graphic novels, but, you know, I think binding six issues of something isn't really a graphic novel. It's a, it's a trade paperback and that may be a distinction that's lost on a lot of people. Um, that, that's fair, but, um, but, but it recognizes that these things need to sit on a shelf. And, and by doing that, you, you do to some degree undermine the collectability of the original because, you know, when we were kids, if you wanted to read that issue or, or this story arc, you had to get your hands on those issues. Yeah. And that created a certain value. Whereas today, if, if you can just go get the trade paperback, which is constantly in print, you know, it's much more convenient than in going hunting for uh, individual issues, right? It definitely... Uh, torpedoes that uh, collectible market. Yeah. So it's still there, and there's some things that will always be valuable, but it's less of a thing. And more and more, we see American comics splintering into these two camps the direct market, like monthly comic thing, which is dwindling by the month, and uh, the book market thing, which has been growing for the last 10 years. Uh, there was a there was a point where the the statistic was that graphic novels were the only growing sector in publishing period in the United States. Wow. wow. Well, I, I mean, you, if you look at what's going on in entertainment, the comic book, superhero movie, it seems to be like the only big yeah. budget type of genre of movies that are out there. Yeah, um, and it yep. it's a it's it's pretty. When you think of how short of a period of time, like where, where what you're talking about, where things started getting serious, it started getting a lot less tongue in cheek and a little bit more novelistic. Is that even a word? <laughs> um, novel like <laughs> it is. It is now. <laughs> uh, uh, and then next thing you next thing you know, like this is. American entertainment as far as the mainstream. It, it went from truly the underground to now, you know, it, yeah. it's, it's pretty impressive. I, yeah. I, I'm just, but you, you a little bit, uh, a little while ago <laughs> in this conversation, we talked, you mentioned something about, um, I was, I was trying to tie it back to the, the, the book that the, I guess it was two comic books that you did about your family parade with fireworks. Oh yeah. One. Yeah. That was one book. It was one book. It came out as two issues. Okay. Yeah. It was, it was originally was this a weird two issue, uh, mini series. And, and they put that together as a, as a book. So I, I tend to think of it as like this standalone book, but it did originally come out as, as two issues. It was kind of a weird format. So when, when I look at the pages that you've been posting on your, um, Instagram, and I immediately was uh -huh. I'm like trying to find all right, where can I buy this? Where, where is that available? Oh, because the artwork itself looks. I mean, it's truly like you could tell that you were really inspired by this story. Um, yeah, and yeah. Then, and was, then that was, reading uh, the synopsis of it, I'm like, holy cow! Uh, yeah, you know, my dad and I were going to drive. We have some relatives in Virginia. And uh, a number of years ago, we were going to drive to Virginia. You know, I was, again, I was living in Brooklyn and, and my dad's in, in Jersey. So I, he wanted to get an early start. So I, I came the night before and we were just sort of hanging out. And he, you know, my, my, my parents are immigrants. They came uh, to the U.S. in the 60s. And uh, my dad still gets like um, uh, Italian newspapers and, and stuff like that. And like, he gets this little journal from his hometown, you know, it takes like forever to get here. <laughs> That's awesome. And yeah, so we were, we were going to go on this trip and he had just gotten a new issue of that thing. And it had a uh, remembrance uh, of this event that took place. Um, and he showed it to me and he showed me like, there was a bunch of like old photos in it and he pointed out and he was like um you know that's your uncle and he or your great uncle and he and he told me this story about his dad 
that I had never heard. Wow. <laughs> I mean, he, he actually really never talked about his dad. And he told me this story that, you know, like literally made my hair stand on end. Like I was stunned, you know, I, mean, I was stunned by the story, but I was also like, how do I, how do I not know this? You know, like I was quite old at the time when he told me this and I was like, how have you just never brought this up? So we went on this trip. Uh, but then when we came back, I was like, go start all over, you know, and I started <laughs> elaborate writing this thing down. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and trying to elaborate, and and uh, then then I reached out to family that was still in Italy. We got a bunch of court papers that are crazy; they're like handwritten from the twenties. I mean, it was really amazing stuff. Um, so I just started again, like like we were just saying. I just it never occurred to me that anybody would publish that story. It didn't. I didn't even it didn't even cross my mind. I just started making it and putting it online. And I was maybe 10 pages in when an, an editor from uh, Shadowline, which is one of the image partners, um, wrote and was like, you want to publish this? Wow. And, um, and that's, that's how that ended up getting uh, published. But, um, you know, the, the, that original volume, it's still available if you track it down. It's a little hard to get. And, uh, I mean, I think it's officially out of print, um, you know, and... and you know, at some point, I I'd like to do another printing of it. You know, maybe something that I I control, or you know, that's you know, maybe I take over the printing of it. Um, you know, there's there's still copies of it around. The pages you've uh, you shared that, are just stunning. Like the thank the you. artwork looks, um, yeah, it looks more. It, it doesn't look like a, a comic book as far as. I don't that that doesn't sound right. That doesn't that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm looking for the words to say for this. It but it it looks very much like a storybook. Like the pages mm, that you've yeah, shared. Okay. And it might be just because the pages you've shared are, are establishing uh pages. <laughs> that that might be why I'm thinking that. But I'm like No, I mean that that's pretty much what it, you know, it's pretty consistent throughout, you know. I wanted something that was like um rustic and homespun and lumpy, you know, and Im imperfect because I'm, I was receiving this thing, um, you know, it's sort of a family story. It's an oral story. It's, it's, there's a certain imperfection in that. And I, you know, um, I wanted, I wanted it to look that way. You know, one thing, you know, uh, if you, if you go through my Instagram, you know, I, I try to design every project. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I see the similarities, but I try to like cast it, you know, like what, what, what is the best way to show this story and what does the story look like? You know, um, so each book really has a unique look, you know, or at least they look different from each other. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things I think about when I'm, when I'm making something is, uh, you know, what does this, what does this look like? And so in, in that case, I just wanted something that was sort of like, simple and and um homemade yeah i mean if that makes it, sense it feels like you could expand upon that easily too because uh, the synopsis uh, it, correct me if i'm wrong from what i read is uh, your uh grand or your great uncle moved to uh or was it your great uncle right or is your well, grandfather? Uh, the, the, it's a couple people my, my grandfather is a main character okay. in the story and his and his brother is a main character in the story. So yeah, there is, there is a great uncle in it. And my grandfather moved to Chicago in it. to start selling olive oil, which is fantastic. Well, my, my grandfather came and went, he came and went a couple of times. I actually have this ship. Um, you know, I have, I have the document from him passing through Ellis Island a wow. couple of times. He kept coming and going and, uh, he, he hated it here. He didn't like it. I couldn't, I mean, that's why I kept going back. Italy's kind of beautiful, especially if you're a farmer <laughs> <laughs> who, who, or, or, you know, um, yeah, I was in Italy a couple of years ago with my son for a school trip. I went as like a chaperone oh, cool. and yeah. one of my wife's friends from high school, uh, her father had moved, he was Italian. He moved back to Italy and he was in, uh, Assisi selling okay. olive oil in a shop. Yeah. And yeah. it was, yeah, we went yeah. in there. Uh, my son was 14 at the time and, he gave us both a glass of port wine and he's like, here, drink this. 
and now taste this and taste this. <laughs> and I was just like, my son's going to never want to leave Italy now. <laughs> He's going to think this is the greatest yeah. place ever. Yeah, that's but awesome. So your grandfather went to Chicago. Um, he went back home because of an uprising of fascism. Well, he, he in, in Chicago, you know, he got to Chicago and, um, you know, he had friends that were already here, but there was like selling anything. Um, you know, there was a lot of factions and rivalry and, and uh, there was actually like, you know, in, in, in the importing business, you, you start to get mixed up with, you know, a lot of mob stuff yeah. and his friends started turning up dead. So he got out. Ah. So he, he, he went back to Italy. So he, he goes back to Italy and, you know, the story really takes off in 1923, which is the year that uh, the fascist party became an actual um, political party, an official political party in, in Italy. And, um, you know, with, you know, uh, with current events and stuff, I, mean, I think about this every day, but it's, it's what started me, um, you know, the idea of how a, a democracy sort of votes its way into a fascist uh, dictatorship is sort of like, it's really hard to understand. And um, I did a lot of, of reading uh, trying to, un just trying to understand that question. Like, how do, how do you go from one to the other? And um, I got to say, I read thousands of pages of what were supposedly the, the you know, best Pulitzer Prize winning books on the subject and it's all great reading, but, but I would be lying if I said I ever understood, you know, I, they can tell you that this event leads to this event, but on a, on a real like human level, understanding what compels regular people, right. To drive this, yeah. you know, to elect, to drive this from one to the other is what I, wanted to know, right? And I never found a book. I learned a lot, but I never found a book that filled that hole for me, that made me, that gave me that light bulb moment where I was like, ah, I see. And, and that in, in some ways was the exploration in, in that little story. I mean, it's a very little story parade with fireworks. And, and there were a lot of places where I would ask my dad, like, you know, there's a scene that involves uh, the sister where she does something uh, in the story that's kind of inconceivable, and I was like, "Well, you know, when he when he told me, well, well, then she, you know, did this, you know, I'm just like, why, why, why would you do that? And no one knows. That's the problem with these family stories. Like, I don't know. So, so in writing that scene, I was like, well, I can I can make her this like two dimensional kind of like you know <laughs> bad person, right? But why would I do that? That's what every time I hit one of those, I was like, why would I do what that? What could drive you to right? do what would something? Call, you know, what could drive me to do that? Right. And, um, and I tried to answer it in that way, you know, um, and, and just sort of play with this question of like, um, what, is, what is really driving the way Italy is separating at that time, you know? Um, and, and it really does, it really does like pull apart and, you know, it's, it enters the war under Mussolini, you know, but I, you know, easily half the country is not on board. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, since then, you know, the performance of the, the Italian army in, in World War II, you know, was a joke. Right. And, and I get that. <laughs> right. But to, to be honest, there's part of me that chooses to believe, right, that um, Italians for a great, a great number of Italians were, were like, you know, they were just not on board. Yeah. I mean, it, right? we see it uh, in, we're seeing it firsthand now in a, a very strange. That's where I'm going. Yeah, a, That's where I'm going. Unfortunately, I've, I've really had my, uh, I've really had my question answered, I believe. My question is answered. I've now, I've been given a front row seat to answering this question that I was tugging at uh, years ago in that book. I, I, I would rather I still 
didn't know the answer. Uh, unfortunately, now I feel like I understand it much, much more. It's, it's weird because I think uh, in our lifetime, what we've seen, uh, especially once you get to an age where you're more politically aware, and I think being involved in punk rock helped us kind of see yeah. see behind what was being fed to us. But yeah, well, we've been we've been dealing with Nazi punks a lot longer than most well, people. We we were aware that there was something wrong during the Reagan years. Like we were completely absolutely. Aware a lot of our families were, you know, thinking it was everything was great. We were like, uh, something's wrong here. And then, yeah, uh, definitely the second Bush, the first Bush was one thing, um, but then the second Bush, you know, we we're all like, this is border, you know this is borderline fascism. What's going on here? Uh, we get this yeah. glimmer of hope after that, literally yeah. labeled as hope and change, <laughs> only to be met with a ripcord that's throwing us so far into a danger, into the red zone. We're like, we're, we're at like 30 seconds to midnight at this point. And, and, yeah. um, and it's a, it's a strange thing because you're seeing how many people you love, you care about, uh, that are still on board with that mentality. Like they're still buying into it and, and you can't figure out whether is it because they're not truly paying attention and they're just consuming just enough to, to satisfy whatever weird ideals they might have or yeah. do they actually believe in this stuff? Like do, do they think it's okay to send in the goon squad into Portland and start picking up kids off the street? Like that's, that's yeah. an extremely... Every few days, I find myself once again being shocked. Yeah, yeah, it's a punch in the face every other day. And I can't believe that we've gotten to this place and that we've let it get to this place and that there are so many people who are still on board with this. Uh, you know, I, I don't doubt for a minute this is not going to be an easy race. I don't care what the polls say. <laughs> yeah. I think it's going to be a very tough fought race. It's going to get ugly. And it's, it's weird because you find yourself... Or I, I've gotten so sensitive to the negativity that even the people that I agree with are putting me on edge. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I have to unfollow. Oh, I, I, I hear have you. To unfollow people who I agree with because it's yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's upsetting. To some extent, that's that's worse. You know, that's that's harder to deal with. Uh, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. That's actually I've been enjoying Instagram a lot because um, it's curated. <laughs> well. Yeah, I mean, like I'm following. I, I get a lot of art. There's a lot, lot less politics there. You know, following a lot of arts and, and museums and stuff like that. And you know, so I get a, a totally different. Ex there's a lot less commentary and there's more just like showing stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a, it's a, it's a much better experience. And you know, pretty much, you know, I, I check in on on the other stuff, but um, I've really pulled back from it because it, it, it ain't fun. It's and I don't know how much of it is even real. You know, uh, yeah. it's not even real. Yeah, it's 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 become. Um, a, you almost have to kind of like sit down, and brace yourself before you open up Facebook these days. <laughs> so like, am I ready for this? Do I? Am I in a good mood? Do I want that to change? <laughs> yeah, I, it's exactly my, my experience. All right, I'm gonna uh, yeah. try to ask you a couple of real quick questions because I, I know we're we're. Uh, I want to value your time here, um, so. Where did you, you, it sounds to me from what you said before in the eighties, you started working in, in publishing. Um, so you, when I met you, you were playing music. Uh, I met yeah. you through, uh, I guess the bouncing souls kind of introduced a, a bunch of bands that I ended up loving like sticks and stones and Weston and you know, that whole yeah. kind of scene over there. Cause I was on long yeah. Island and you know, it was a weird time of my life where, you know, I was a teenager going to the punk rock clubs yeah. there and, you know, we're in our yeah. own band and then we're playing and, and whatnot and making these connections with people that are all over the country eventually. Yeah. What, um, so, so you were into art first. That was your first, uh, passion. How yeah, did you get I, into music? I was always, I was always doing both. I think, you know, I had a, I had my first guitar. I was in fourth or fifth grade. Wow. 
you know, I was nine, nine years old. I had my first guitar maybe. And, and I was also like, drawing was just something I always did uh, as far back as I can remember. Um, music was something that, you know, my parents, when we were kids, they, you know, they kind of wanted all of us to learn an instrument. My, my brother played drums, my sister played piano, and I played guitar. Um, it was just, it was you know, there wasn't this big stress or pressure on it. It was just like a thing that they wanted us to do. And um, drawing was a pastime for me. It was like play. I wasn't a physically active kid. I, I just would draw and draw and draw forever. I was a huge reader. And um, I think in my mind, I was going to be, I, I really wanted to be a writer. I think when I, when I first, when I was old enough to even conceive of, oh, I have to have a career, you know, I think what I wanted was to write. That's amazing. And then it was, it was late, kind of, I was, you know, pretty old when I, when I got just really excited about comics. And it seemed to be this thing where, you know, that, that light bulb moment where you realize, well, this is both, you know, this, this is this uh, realm where I can draw and write. And it's ultimately, it's, it's a single, it's a storytelling medium. And I think that's what kind of caught my imagination. So when you met me, you know, I was saying the early nineties, um, I was a freelance. I was a working freelancer. I was um, a colorist. I was doing a lot of work for a, a company in New York called Valiant Comics, and um, you know, I was I was a colorist for for Valiant. And uh, Valiant, you know, really kind of fueled sticks and stones. Okay. Like it was, you know, val Valiant money that paid for our vans, put us on the road, paid for our records. You know, that's how I was paying for everything. So, this is so. How much of your punk rock experience, you guys? Uh, Sticks and Stones, uh, every band that tours has a, a war stories. I feel like we, I think <laughs> our generation, we didn't have a war like that. We, But if for those of us that were in punk rock, we kind of created our own war-like uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome uh, my, situations. My grandfather used to say the same thing. I, I would go see my grandfather and tell him, you know, I just come back from tour and I go visit my grandparents and I would tell him about it. My grandfather fought in World War II and uh, I would tell him and he would just look at me like barely comprehending half of what I was saying and then he would be like, it sounds like the army. That's what he always said. It sounds like the army. I think, honestly, when I went, the first time uh, my band went to uh, Germany, my, my grandfather also, my grandfather raised me as he was kind of like the father figure in my life. And that was the first time he even like took the idea of me playing in a band seriously. Uh -huh. And I think it was because he was in World War II. He's a World War II vet and he was stationed in Germany in, in Heidelberg. Yeah. And once I got I went there and came back, he was like, Oh my gosh. Like we have yeah, something yeah, in real. common now. <laughs> like he he felt like yeah. he could talk to me about it at that point. And he actually started listening That's to cool. the music and 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 whatnot. <laughs> but you guys had some crazy uh yeah. I mean, the the your van burnt down, like burnt to the ground, <laughs> and someone got uh, to trailer. record it. It was it was the trailer. the trailer. It was the trailer with all of your, yeah. you know the all the gear. Uh, yeah, that. And somebody recorded yep. it, and it made it on. It was on the yep. the Optimus Club, right? Or was it on the Strife and Time? Yeah, yeah. It was on one of your. No, it was not. Well, that was that was just the comp. That was a collection of stuff. So yeah, it was. It, I mean, it was on the Optimus Club. Okay. But, yeah, made it, it made it to the compilation afterwards. Yeah, we re we recorded a lot that um, that trip. Yeah, but they, I, was, I was always just kind of like, why can't this band catch a break? They're so good. <laughs> you guys were the reason our, our second record, we went to Trax East Studios because I was like, where does Sticks and Stones record? Because I just love the way their records sound. Trax East was awesome. Yeah, and yeah. Eric Rachel, I believe, was who was, who was yeah, our Eric engineer. Rachel. Yeah, that, so it's... It, it's the kind of like weird incestuous punk rock thing where you're like, I like the way this sounds. What did, what is that? Like what kind of guitar are they using? I, I think, I think lifetime did some work there too. I'm, I'm not sure, but I feel like lifetime might've done stuff there too. It's, uh, there was a lot of the Jer Northern Jersey bands recorded there. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I remember I slept on the couch because yeah, there were some days where we were there late and I was just like, I'm going to, I'll crash here on the couch. And, uh, I didn't want to drive back cause I knew I had to do some tracking in the morning and, and 
Yeah. Yeah, that place was awesome. Oh, for you, it was a haul. Oh, yeah. Well, we were, yeah, we were all around Long Island, so it was just like, it was yeah. hours getting through Manhattan alone. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was, so, and then I didn't know about your art career until you did the cover for the Bounce of Souls second record, Maniacal Laughter. Yeah, that was a collaboration between me and Brian. Brian, Brian drew it, and I did, you know, because I was the I was coloring, uh-huh. you know, for comics, and so I I threw the color on. That's awesome. But it was a funny, you know, like we at this point we were we had we were living together now. So the so, half of Sticks and Stones and half of the Souls were sharing a house in Hoboken, and so Brian was there a lot, and we sort of like that's that house is really where we got to know each other really well. You know, we, we kind of sort of knew each other and, um, you know, me and Brian, re- you know, Brian's a great artist and, um, we really bonded over drawing and we would have these like drink coffee and destroy sessions at night <laughs> where we, you know, we would stay up all night and just, you know, work and draw and stuff and, and swap ideas. And so when he was, he had the concept for that album cover and he's like, how do I do this right? You know, <laughs> And uh, I was like, well, you got to, you know, you got to shoot photo reference. You got to light it. You know, you're going to draw from the photos and, you know, you'll have those when you do the color for the rendering, and blah, you know, which is how an illustrator would mm-hmm. do it. Right. So, you know, we, I still have those photos somewhere. I think they made it into that uh, book that they did recently. They did that scrapbook. Oh yeah. The, the third year um, anniversary book. It, yeah. Yeah. Really we went down to my the basement. <laughs> <laughs> We we posed everybody, we lit everyone, we, we photographed it and you know, Brian did the, the the drawings and then you know, I just I just added the color. Yeah. But you know, we did a number of collaborations after that too. We did a lot of little stuff together. That's awesome. And then you did Johnny X and the Conspiracy. Yes. Uh that you know, Sticks and Stones broke up and you know, me and the drummer, Chris, kind of formed uh the conspiracy. And, um, you know, we gave that a, you know, our best shot and, uh, we did a little traveling with that. Not much. It didn't last long. And that it's sort of Chris quit. I didn't want to replace him. Yeah. And, um, it morphed into what became zero zero, which was like the remnants of the conspiracy and the remnants of lifetime and a couple other people. Wow. Yeah. And then, and which, then somehow you became like a school teacher. <laughs> uh, well, you know, not, not that long ago, so this opportunity came up for me to uh, just teach at uh, the school of visual arts in New York. So I just, you know, I do this one, it's like one elective class that's, you know, just about coloring, which, you know, was, was, was my start in, in comics. And um, this is a digital color class that I do at SVA. So what do you think the kid who, was torn around the country. Um, you know, if anything, like every other band, you you're trying to figure out how you're going to get enough gas to get to the next show. Um, if you were to, if that person, that version of you were to see what you've done now in your life in, in art and in, and in, uh, just how far you've come and what you've d- accomplished, what do you think that person would say to you? A lot of people will ask what you would say to that person. You don't want to mess with how you got here, but what do you think that person would think of seeing what you've done now? He would say, what took you so long? <laughs> That's what he would say. What took you so long? Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, but can you yeah. imagine if you, like, how would you, can you imagine if you tried to create Nico Bravo when you were 19? Yeah. Um, it's true. Every, you know, every idea has its time and you can't make it happen when you want. It doesn't happen when you want it to happen. It happens when, when it happens. Um, and that's a, a tough thing for all, all, all artists of all stripes, you know, to have to deal with because in between, you know, we've, we've got to eat and, you know, we, we need to have a roof over our heads. And, and that's a frustrating thing about being an independent artist. Um, but uh, I, when I, when I was in art school, um, you know, a teacher told me something along the lines of like, um, that you, you have to be, to, to do this, you have to have a little bit of thick headedness because it, it doesn't make sense as a thing to do. 
it's not a practical or even smart thing to do. And, um, and people telling you like, maybe you should do something more practical. Like they're not wrong, you know? Um, but, uh, in order to, to ever get anywhere, you have to have a little bit of like, you have to be a little, it's not about being thick skinned. It's about being thick skulled. <laughs> yeah. The, you have to right? have a determination that, that will defy yeah. any logic. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You have to have, you have to be willing to defy logic. And, um, uh, so as awful as this might sound, I think there was always part of me that not only expected this, but expect, continues to expect a lot more, you know, I don't really feel like I'm anywhere, you know, like every day is, is every day is a hard day, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I, I work, I work 10 or 12 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> That's what I do. I, you know, every, and I realize I'm not digging a ditch, you know, I'm drawing, I'm drawing unicorns and stuff. So it's, it's, it's cool, you know, but, um, but can but, you imagine if you were digging a ditch that there's something in the creative, uh, pursuits that brings you a level of happiness that I don't think um, is is obtainable by by a person who has that creative spirit to get somewhere. In, in other words, that thing might exist in an athlete. It might exist in um, you know any other uh, uh, an accountant or whatever. But if you have that creative talent, there's a part of you that has to do that. I stepped away from yeah. creativity for years. Uh, when I got married, um, and the band, you know, we kind of put an end to the band because uh, we were pregnant. I had to, I had to have a career, and I went back to school yeah. for um, computer networking stuff. And then I worked in uh, doing that. And I've been doing that for for a long time for for, for I guess almost twenty years now. Um, yeah, and then somewhere along the way like there was this emptiness like i and then i i discovered photography and that became my creative outlet that i could actually because it, it, if i didn't i don't know what i would do you know e even a few years away from having some sort of creative output it was like i i can't <laughs> i can't, there's some there's a hole in me if i don't do something yeah. where i'm creating um yeah so uh, is there something that you've learned from all this journey that you've gotten to where you are today that um, that you think that brings happiness to you that you could kind of pinpoint where like you know I know you were saying earlier that the, that being able to be the sole creator of a comic book is a totally different thing like is that something you would say to anyone getting into there hey make sure you have something you're doing that you own Absolutely. I, absolutely. Um, I mean that, that I think, you know, I mean, I agree, I agree with everything that you're saying. I, I totally identify with it. And, um, uh, what, I, what I found, you know, my own, with my own experience, what I found was that for the people who are my friends and family who are not necessarily like creative people, when they, you know, when, when I've talked to them over the years and they look at what I'm, you know, what, what I'm doing at that time, um, it all kind of looks the same to them. For example, if I'm a storyboard artist on a um, Mattel direct to DVD animated special, mm -hmm. right? That That's equal. That's the same as me writing and drawing Nico Bravo to them. See? Right. And it's all, it's all creative to them, you know, Sto a storyboard artist on a, on a Mattel, uh, uh, product placement DVD is creative to them. To me, it was soul crushing, you know, like I felt suicidal. Wow. You know, I'm, I, I mean, I, I mean that literally, you no, know, I, 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 and I, I I'm, I'm thinking of a, I'm thinking of a particular job that I actually quit. I actually quit because I was like, I feel like I'm going to kill myself. You know, I need, I need to leave 
this job. And so, um, I'm, I'm not, you know, like, like so my, my parents are immigrants. My, my dad was a mechanic, you know, my mom was a seamstress. I, I'm not, you know, a rich kid who went to art school, you know, um, uh, you worked your way so up. So th- yeah. those, um, um, those decisions have repercussions, like leaving, leaving a job like that's paying you well, right? It's not something that you do flippantly. It's, it, it's like, a it's inconvenient at the time to feel like I have to, in order to survive, I need to leave this thing that's paying my rent, you know, but leaving that thing, you know, led me to first, second books, right. Which, which led to a couple of great, uh, projects for me, you know, great in terms of my experience, you know, and, and led to Nico Bravo, you know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, it's one of those at the things. time you don't, you, you, yeah, yeah. You don't know where it's going, you know, but you know you got to go, and so if there's one, that's one thing that I've had. Which I, I'm, I'm just trying to say, I'm not saying that's a that's a good thing to have because, you know, I could be I could be uh, on a milk crate under a bridge in the rain right now. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not, but but um, that's a toss up. It's totally, you know, it's totally random that I, that I'm not. So I'm not I'm not saying that as a good thing, but. I've never been able to rest in those jobs. I, I you think know? it's important and, to know when you need to walk away, though. When when to understand, like that, you might. It is, yeah. but but you know, but you know that you don't always have that option, right? Oh yeah, I mean, there's there are clients right. that I have that I just, you know, the, the act of calling them is soul crushing. Just knowing that I have to <laughs> interact with this person for for you know, and spend any of my waking moments interacting with them. But I know that yeah. for I have employees, I have overhead, I've got, you know, I have to do that kind of stuff if I want to keep it going. Um, I get, yeah. you, you got to take one for the, the team. But there is an art of saying no. There, There is a point where... Oh, it's... And it feels good. Yeah. And, and it... <laughs> uh, I, I'm telling you, I, I've only been doing this podcast for, for a little while now. Um but it's a constant theme that has come up from uh, the person yeah. I spoke to bef- uh, previously. She's an actress from New York. Um, she was a voice actress for 35 years, and she ran these loop groups, which they did all of the ADR work for major films, like every thing you can think of, TV. Um, they were doing the background audio of like crowds and things like that. And, stuff like that. And mm-hmm. she, she had this extremely successful business and that somebody got involved with her who basically stole the business from her. But through that process, a door opened and now she's doing act. She's acting on screen. So she was, she was right. in the Joker. She was in like the, the, oh, wow. the ultimate scene of the Joker when he's on stage with De Niro. She's the, she's, she was the guest that's on the couch next to him. Yeah. Cool. So, but those kind of opportunities opened up when when something awful happened to her. But it's a common thing yeah. that I'm seeing with talking to people. Like some of the worst things or or hardest decisions they've made ultimately get them to where they need to be. I think that's definitely true. And as I look back, that's been exactly true. And uh, I feel like I've. Again, you can't manufacture those moments and they don't happen as soon as you want them to happen. But the, I just, I guess I've just been lucky where as I look back, I feel like, um, at those crossroads, I, I made, I made the right choices, you know, when, when, the, when I finally had the choice to make, you know? So when I look now, I feel like, um, I'm with, I'm working with the publisher of my choice. Yeah. Um, I adore my editor. He, um, he's able with a couple words or a sentence that I might not even realize he said until the following day, he's able to push me out of my comfort zone and sort of challenge me, uh, to do something I didn't know I could do. And he's done that on a, on a couple of my, um, recent books, uh, which is why I love working with him. He does it in, in an invisible way. And, um, and then after that, I, I feel like I've had complete freedom to do whatever I want. 
Um, First Second, I believe, is one of the premier publishers of graphic novels in the country. And uh, almost daily, I um, wonder how I'm here, you know, doing my own book for the publisher of my choice with, you know, the editor of my choice. Um, it's great, you know, and it, and it really does come down to listening to your gut at those moments where it, it might not be the most practical decision, but it's the one that's, you know, um, true, you know, to you. Yeah. Right. That feels true. Right. And, and that's your guide, you know, to people kind of, Starting out, you know, when I was starting out, the, the path was that you learn the skills um, being employed at the Marvels and the DCs and those kind of publishers. You, you hope to maybe, a great thing you could do was to assist a professional cartoonist on one of those books where you erase their pencils or fill in big black areas or something simple like mm-hmm. that or rule their panel borders or whatever. And, you know, you, you sort of learn the trade in that way and then hope for a break, you know, to maybe take on your own thing. And, and I think what's changed is that the, that there's a variety of publishers today and the interest is in, uh, people, people telling their stories, right? The things that are true to them, the, the, their experiences and, uh, and, uh, Rather than genre work like, you know, sci-fi or superhero stuff or whatever, it's, it's real stuff, right? Um, and, and, and there's, a, there's a desire to hear a diversity of voices and a diversity of styles, right? This wasn't the case when I was starting out. So this, so this necessity to sort of do your time in the trenches racing uh, pencils and filling in black is simply not necessary. If you if you have if you have a, something to say, you know, and you have the skill to say it, right, and it's a vital story, someone wants you to tell it, yeah, right, and you can just go tell it, right. You don't have to draw, you know, fill in backgrounds on the Hulk for five years before you get your chance. The, the publisher exists for you to tell that story, you know. And the, and, the, and the other thing that I've been telling my colleagues, I, I've been saying recently, a couple of years ago, I was, I was telling, um, you know, my cartoonist friends, like, the future is about ownership. That's what I was saying, right? And I realized maybe within the past year or so that that is no longer true. I can no longer say the future is about ownership. I have to say it's about ownership now. This is it, right? It's about ownership because those Marvel movies that we referenced earlier, Mm -hmm. right? All that stuff that we referenced earlier, those things are based on specific issues and specific stories that came out of the imagination of individual people, right? Who might get um, two tickets to the opening, right? And maybe a credit, they and maybe the story, they, even though they created because they didn't own it, you know, and maybe a li- maybe a little bit of money or some kind of royalty, something maybe, right? But but we're we're in a time where like all forms of entertainment are looking directly right at us, right? And you know, if. If, if I know, I know we're going over That's time. Okay. Probably, no, right? there's, if I could there's no tell time you, limit. A, a turning, it's all on, on a turning <laughs> point. A turning point for me in this. I'm going to bring it back to this mm-hmm. as long as I don't lose my train of thought. But a turning point to me was one one of my favorite jobs. I was a storyboard artist at MTV Animation when they still had uh, uh, an office in New York City. It was a great experience. Fifteen fifteen. Just awesome people. I wasn't at fifteen fifteen. That was the <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I worked at MTV. Paramount Plaza. I worked at MTV Networks as an IT person for like four years. At both places? I was primarily at fifteen fifteen. Fifteen. But 15. I was there dur- I was, was there during the, the buyout where we were part of that. So yeah, I would go over to every once in a while if they needed help over there. Yeah, I was on I, I was a board artist on Celebrity Deathmatch for awesome. you know a few years. <laughs> 
And um, I, I did love that job. And it was a great job. I learned a lot. I met a lot of amazing people. But, uh, you know, they just called a meeting one day and they said, we're done. Wow. You know? And I went home and on, my, on the floor in my workspace in my apartment, there were like three towering, like man-sized piles of old story. You know, a storyboard is like a few hundred pages long for one episode, you know? So I had all these, you know, previous episodes just stacked in the corner. I mean, they're literally up to my chest, you know? And I was someone who, whose, you know, love was supposed to be comics, but who had segued into animation because the work and the experience and the money was better, you know? And I had for like nine years, I had just not thought about comics. And then this day came when they were like, okay, we're done. And I went home and just sort of turned my head. And there was that stack of like thousands of pages of storyboards I had drawn. And I thought, you know, what if a fraction of that, a, a quarter of that, an eighth of that had just been my comic, you know, yeah. none of that is mine. I don't, can't, I can't do anything with that, you know, none of that is mine. So over the last decade that just evaporated into doing this very cool job, you know, uh, what did I do that's mine? Nothing. You know, and from that day on, I was like, no matter what job I do to make money, you know, no matter what it is that's putting food on my table or roof over my head, I will be doing something that's mine. Whether I do a page a week, doesn't matter, but I have to push something forward no matter what. I mean, even if no one else sees it, I don't care. Right. And I did. And th that's how I rebuilt my, you know, this was in the middle. I had worked in comics. I had segued out into animation for a decade and then I came back in with all the, the first second stuff and, and the more recent stuff. So this was like, my, this is how I rebuilt a, a career that, that had vanished for a decade, you know, was just by doing a little bit of stuff that, I, that was intended for me. And so I would say to anyone today, like, you don't have to do your time in the trenches, you know, laboring over something that's not yours. If you have a story to tell and the skills to tell it, tell it, do wow. it, put it online, get it out into the world, mm -hmm. right? Because now, people are looking for this, right? Yeah, and, now and more every, than ever. Every, yeah. Now more than ever. And, and every, you know, I, I, believe in, I believe in books. I love books and I believe in doing books for the sake of doing books. But, but you can't ignore the fact that like every other uh, distribution model or, you know, entertainment model is looking directly at us, graphic novel creators, right now, right? It's not the future anymore, it's today, right? So that, that I think, you know, when I meet people who, who their dream is to draw um, Captain America, I mean, I love Captain America, I love Batman, I love that stuff, but I don't want to draw it. I don't care. I want to be entertained by it for a couple hours. I want to buy a comic and read it. I want to watch a movie of it or something, but I ain't going to make yeah, it. You don't want to be in a cover band. Right? If you're a, uh, no one dreams of being I, in a cover band. They, but they do. That's in <laughs> comics. They do. They want it. Yeah. Their dream is to draw Batman. And so I, when I meet true. those people, <laughs> it's cool. And I respect you. And many of them can draw rings around me. They draw much better than I do, you know, but, um, I don't want to do it, and uh, and I, I can't relate to it at all. I can't relate to wanting to do it, really, not really, uh, and and I don't recommend it to people. I don't recommend it. I I say just make make your thing, you know, and own it, and 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 good things will happen. You know, I, I, get get tell that story that you've got to tell, yeah. and good things will happen. I think it's clear that you, from your upbringing, immigrant family, um, kind of trades people people with you know hardworking trade based jobs um you were you grew up knowing what you needed to do just to get by you did uh, you you were in punk bands you did your own thing you had this DIY work ethic the whole time uh and that i think you have a special 
uh, gift to, to take that DIY mentality, that punk rock mentality, and apply it to the rest of your life. And I see it in a lot of the people that were in bands that have kind of moved on in their life that I still yeah. keep in touch with. A lot of them have gone on to become entrepreneurs or artists in some fashion and they they do yeah. they have that mentality of like you got to do it yourself no one else is going to do it for you but you, you don't want to make other people um rich <laughs> for lack of, you know it's not about yeah. money but yeah, you yeah. don't want to work for someone else you want to work for what you what your vision is and and that's an excellent absolutely message. and I, I think uh i think it shows in your work the passion in your work the fact that you're you're taking these um, you know, these steps in your career now and putting out work that shows that is, I can't imagine, I mean, just Nico Bravo itself, I can't imagine that that won't either be picked up as a cartoon series or as a movie, uh, a movie series type of thing. You could keep that going for, for however you want, however, it's such a, an awesome idea it's so Thank but it, beyond the idea being awesome it's so well done that i i Thanks. think you're going to be one of those people like later on in your career you're going to be like why couldn't i have all of this before but as we've <laughs> i'm already at that point yeah. i'm already at that <laughs> but point. as we've discussed you had to get here uh yeah. if it was handed yeah. to you it wouldn't be the same um, no, it happens when it happens. Yeah. It happens in its own time. Well, Mike, I think this has been an awesome conversation. It's been, it's been, a, it's been fun talking to you. I'm glad we got to uh, chat, and thank you for reaching out. Thank you.